The guaranteed fresh people at Dairy Lee are happy to make this film available for all you loyal Mets fans. In this America's bicentennial year, a somewhat younger institution than the USA, the New York Mets celebrated their 15th season. Playing in Shea Stadium for the 13th year, the Mets are one of baseball's most popular franchises, and their accessible, well-maintained ballpark is just one of the many reasons for that popularity. The Mets introduced a new manager, Joe Frazier, for the opening of the 1976 campaign, and manager Frazier called upon a well-proven commodity Tom Seaver, 1975 Cy Young Award winner to get the Mets rolling. The Montreal Expos provided the opposition and Seaver received some timely hitting support from shortstop Bud Harrelson. Harrelson's long double brought home two runs and keyed the Mets opening day victory. Skip Lockwood came on for a save and ended the game with a strikeout as the Mets were off on a winning note with a super pitching staff showing the way. Envied throughout baseball, the Mets possessed depth, relievers, and aces. Jerry Kuzman, Tom Seaver, John Matlack, Mickey Lolich, Greg Swan, Bob Apodaca, and Skip Lockwood in his first full year as a med reliever after joining the organization in mid-75. I had a chance to go to the Mets. I was very pleased when the Mets called me. And I came here last year, and uh, I was very happy to get a chance to throw. Bob Apodaca was a relief pitcher here at 14 saves and threw the ball very well. I didn't really think I was going to get a chance to pitch as much as I did, get a chance to demonstrate uh, the kind of velocity and the kinds of relief pitching I thought I was capable of doing. And I was just real pleased to get the, the limited amount of exposure that I had last year. And uh, it is a transition. It's a very difficult transition, I suppose, from being a starting pitcher to being a relief pitcher, in that the starting pitcher is, uh, is a kind of pitcher that has a very routine uh, very much a uh, ritualistic kind of thing. He has to uh, to pitch, and he has to rest, and he has to do his running, and there's, there's a lot of things that he has to be concerned with, where a relief pitcher has to be like a regular player, has to be concerned with playing every day. And Lockwood was ready whenever Joe Frazier called upon him. Lockwood appeared in 56 games with 19 saves, 10 wins, and a remarkable 108 strikeouts in 94 innings pitch. I do think about strikeouts. And I think if I can get strike two on, on most of the people, I feel like I can get them out. Now, whether I strike them out or not depends on whether or not I, the situation would, would dictate it. Uh, I do try for strikeouts. I do, I'm learning how to do it more and more. I watched Tom Seaver pitch and watching Jerry Kuzman and uh, Johnny Matlack pitch, and I've learned a lot. And I think, yes, there's definite ways that you can try for strikeouts. And I think being here is going to increase my chances of striking out more people just because I can watch the artistry of, of three great pitchers. We've been proud of ourselves as a staff uh, in the National League and all of baseball. It's uh, a staff that you can watch any one pitch on the staff and always learn something, whether he's a right-hander or a left-hander. And everyone on the staff seems to complement each other. And it's not, a lot of people have asked me if uh, we're jealous of one another, if I'm jealous of a Tom Seaver or a John Matlack or vice versa. And I said, no, it's quite the opposite. We're very competitive against each other, and we do compete against each other as far as total stats at the end of the year. And it's a, it's a fun game to play. Jerry Kuzman had tons of fun in 76. He enjoyed his first 200 strikeout campaign, ran a strong second to Randy Jones in the Cy Young voting, and fulfilling a pitcher's dream, Kuzman also made a successful run at that coveted 20-game victory plateau. The big night for Coos arrived on September 16th at Shea against the Cardinals. He picks up the sign. Here is the 2-2 pitch. Swing out in this. Check him out. Strike out number 11. Here is the 0-2 pitch. And it's in there for a cold strike three. Kuzman has struck out 12 for the second time this year. Let's send the Stearns again. Here is the 2-2 delivery to Hector Cruz. Swing out in this. Check him out. The ball game is over. Kuzman has his 20th win of the year. He has struck out 13. He is being embraced by Stearns. One of the most popular of all the Mets for all the years he's been here. 
Jackson first came up briefly in 1967. It was a much bigger goal than a lot of the others. And winning 20 games this year was uh, something that's very hard to explain. I guess it was probably like uh, how uh, the whole team felt when we won the World Series in 1969. It was more of a personal feeling. I just wish everyone in the clubhouse that night could have felt the way I did. Tom Seaver knows that feeling well. Seaver followed up on his third Cy Young Award with another good season, highlighted by an extremely stingy 2.59 earned run average. Seaver led all National League pitchers in strikeouts as usual, but toiled in tough luck for much of the season to wind up with a 14 and 11 mark. Five of those 14 wins were shutouts. Seaver continued his amazing string of 200 or more strikeouts for a record-breaking ninth consecutive season, with number 200 coming against the Phillies on September 3rd. The count is one and two. The pitch by Seaver. He struck him out. He got him. That's number 200. And a standing ovation for Tom Seaver, who has now struck out 200 or more batters for the ninth consecutive year, which he spends his own major league record. Seaver didn't stop there. He finished off the Bills with a flourish and a thrilling one to nothing shutout performance and went on to record 235 strikeout victims in 1976. John Matlack came through with his finest season in four categories including his best ever record at 17 and 10. En route to 17 wins, Matlack also recorded six shutouts, tops in the National League. After several years of 500 ball, Matlack has gone 33 and 22 in his last two seasons and may well be on his way to the consistent level of excellence predicted for him by all the experts. Although pitching is the Mets' primary strength, the loyal New York fans had plenty to cheer about out at Shea Stadium in 1976 as a solid Mets team put together its second best one-loss record of all time. Only the 1969 championship team had a higher winning percentage. Ed Cranepool, Mr. Original, the only Met player to appear in all 15 seasons of their existence, had another solid season. Steady Eddie hit a strong 292, and his 10 home runs gave him the most career round trippers of any New York Met. Joe Torrey bounced back from his disappointing initial Mets campaign to return to the ranks of the 300 club. Torrey batted an impressive 306 to lead all Met hitters. Felix Millan continues to perform as one of the National League's most underrated players. His fielding ability is always in the Golden Glove category, and 1976 was no exception, as Millan did everything one can expect of a second baseman and then some. At the plate, Mr. Consistent was, well, consistent. Mian hit his usual 282, which is one point below last season's mark and one point above his lifetime average. Bud Harrelson played in only 34 games in an injury riddle 1975, but he came back glove in hand to appear in 118 contests in 1976. And the Met pitching staff can appreciate that plus 84 in the games played column. Behind the plate, Jerry Grody had another fine year with superior defensive skills and solid offensive contributions too. Best of all, the Mets are a young team with young stars still improving. Dave Kingman, already baseball's biggest home run threat, is a youthful veteran at 28. 
baseball is made up of many, many things, pitching, hitting, running, but uh, probably the thing that I concentrate most on uh, in hitting in particular is, is trying to watch the pitcher, trying to pick up something that, is, that he does that on a certain pitch that he might not do on another. And concentration is, is so important. You have to block out everything that is around you. You go up there and, and you have a, a fear of not being able to um, to come through in that clutch situation. And uh, of course, uh, you know, there are many times you don't and there are many times that you do. Uh, but when you do, it's, it's very rewarding. There's nothing like running the bases and uh, hearing the cheers from the, from the New York fans because uh, anywhere in the country, they produce the most noise and uh, they treat you like a king. Kingman is the king to New York fans. He walloped 37 home runs and 474 at-bats, a ratio of one every 12.8 times up. Dave also led the team in RBIs and game-winning hits. John Milner was right behind Kingman in all critical offensive departments, second in home runs, RBIs, and game winners as he reclaimed a starting for a splitting time between left field and first base. But it really, actually, to me, it really doesn't make any difference as long as I come up to the plate four times a day. You have certain ball players can go out and give you a good two weeks and they may have to rest for three or four days. But I'm the type of guy, I'm, I gotta get in, I gotta get in, get in the groove because my rhythm, you see, it's very easy for me to lose my rhythm. And now that I play every day, I have good rhythm and uh, you, you get a chance to see a lot of pitches. But it's a, it's a thing they say, uh, left-handers can't hit left-handers, but uh, if you can hit it, don't matter who's throwing the ball. Milner proved his point hitting a strong 282 against left-handers. The Hammer also slugged three Grand Slam home runs to become the Mets' all-time leader in that category. At 27 years of age, John Milner should have his best seasons directly in front of him. Mike Phillips spent a busy year as the number one utility man for the Mets. Filling in all around the infield, Phillips was steady defensively and offensively. Mike is yet another member of the Mets' youth corps. He's just 26 years old. Rookie Bruce Beauclair was the Mets' most pleasant surprise at bat during 1976. Beauclair led the team in pinch hitting with a sizzling 571 in that key role, and he hit 287 overall. Unfortunately, all surprises were not pleasant ones. Mike Vale suffered an off-season injury that ruined his year. Hopefully, 1977 will signify a return to the great promise of his rookie campaign. Pepe Manguel came to the Mets from Montreal in a mid-season trade. With speed to burn, Manguel is a part of the Mets' younger and faster outlook on the future. Roy Steger took over as the Mets' regular third baseman midway through the season and gave the team defensive strength at the hot corner. Steger has the sure hands and strong arm that gives manager Joe Frazier peace of mind and a dependable day-in, day-out performer at third base. just served as the backup catcher and provided left-handed hitting with occasional power. Of course, not all of Ron's hits were placed quite this perfectly. In 1975, young John Stern spent the entire season with the Mets and displayed marvelous defensive capability. During the beginning of the 76 campaign, Stearns told Joe Frazier he'd like to be sent out to Tidewater. I didn't want to play the game to be a backup person and to be a bullpen catcher all my life, so uh, I came to the conclusion that I had to get out and play, and uh, Tidewater was the most likely place. Stern spent his summer as an all-star performer in the International League. He came back to the Mets showing that extra season of experience to be a big plus. John returned with sharper skills and maturity. I learned how to think at the plate and learned how to look for certain pitches in certain situations, and I learned a lot about uh, my stroke and, and my limits as an offensive player. Uh, there are certain times when I learned how to try to hit a line drive or move a runner over. It's just basically, I, I just, it was a matter of experience and I needed the games and I'm just real happy about what happened this year. Another very young Met spent a successful minor league year in Jackson, Mississippi, learning his lessons from a Met coach he'd like to emulate. See how, how I catch it? Now watch the difference and me catch it and you catch it. See, I watch my hand as it goes back. Obviously, the coach is Willie Mays, but the other center fielder is Brooklyn-born Lee Mazzilli, a 
Vasily joined the Mets in September, and the switch inning rookie helped knock the Pittsburgh Pirates out of the pennant race with the dramatic bottom of the ninth inning two out home run at Shea. We were down by a run, and uh, just so, so happened that uh, the Pirates felt that I didn't have uh, my power left handed. I had more power right handed, and they were trying to pitch me away. And uh, Kobe, I came over with a pitch uh, that I went out for, and uh, I just got good and good on it, and I hit it out. And it was one of the bigger thrills, you know, trying to you're knock a team out of a pennant race where they were just three, three and a half games out, and which hurt them. Azzilli's home run hurt the Pirates badly, assisted the Phillies greatly. But in the long run, Lee Mazzilli will be a speedy addition to the Met Youth Corps. A 21-year-old native New Yorker, Lee Mazzilli brings back memories. Memories of Ed Cranepool, another native New Yorker and the youngest Met in the year 1962, which was the first of the Mets 15 seasons in the National League. I've uh, enjoyed my relationship with the Met organization since 1962. I was very fortunate to sign with them, and of course, Mrs. Payson uh, was the original owner, and of course she was there involved in the signing of my contract along with George Weiss and Casey Stangle. And we had such a warm relationship through the years, and of course the atmosphere around the Met organization has been great uh, for all the players. Well, I think playing in the polo grounds, of course, which was our first home, was very nostalgic. It was such an old ballpark and a depressing area, but to myself it was home because it was the first big league ballpark I had played in. I was just glad to get to a ballpark. Casey devoted 50 years of his life to baseball, and he always would talk to us, and he would point out other players' mistakes, but uh, to me, he wasn't criticizing the players. This is one thing that was beneath Casey. He wouldn't criticize you. He let you know what your, your weaknesses were, your shortcomings, but I'll tell you, everyone loved him and respected him, and I'm just sorry that we uh, had to lose him last year. The selection of uh, the All-Star team in 1965 was a tremendous thrill. I was 21 at the time, and of course, playing alongside the stars like Willie Mays and Sandy Koufax was a tremendous thrill. And of course, I think I was in awe of these fellas, and I don't think I said two or three words in the whole ball game. And I sat at the end of the bench, and I found uh, to realize later on that uh, that was a seat I would occupy a lot of days uh, in the Met uniform. I think as an organization, I think to be a part of it when you start out in 1962 as a 17-year-old youngster and still be there when an expansion club first wins a pennant in 1969, to me was the biggest thrill because none of the other expansion teams have done so. A major step toward that success came in 1967 when a 22-year-old rookie joined the Mets following a season in Jacksonville. Well, one thing, obviously, that I always remember when my first start in the big league was right here at Chase Stadium in April of 1967, the second game of the year. Don Cardwell had started opening day and I was pitching against the Pirates. And we won the ball game and I think the score was three to two. I was taken out by Wes Westrom at the time, about the seventh or eighth inning. Chuck Estrada came in and uh, threw up a double play ball and we went on to score a run in the, in the eighth or ninth inning or something like that. We ended up winning the, my first ball game that I ever pitched in the, in, in the major leagues we won. I, did, I didn't get the credit for the win, but I participated in a winning effort. That was, a, that was certainly a memorable event for me. I think the thing that I remember most about 1968, really, is Gil Hodges. Um, we were a very young team at that time, and Gil was a very dominant force on, on a baseball field. He was a big man. Physically, he was uh, almost overpowering, great big hands, and uh, he was a very dominant force. And uh, being just, uh, you know, one year for, away from being a rookie, it was, it was quite an experience playing for a man who was as strong in his feelings as Gil was who believed in his feelings and his uh, thoughts on baseball, his beliefs in baseball, and how baseball should be played. I think the changes at, at that time in 1968 that were really turning our ball club into being uh, totally competitive on the field were the emergence of the young players really coming into their own. I'm talking about myself and Jerry Kuzman, Gary Gentry coming along and, and helping us, uh, Buddy Harrelson, Jerry Grody, uh, Cleon Jones and Tommy Agee, we were all in a young young kind of group. We were in every ball game, and we were, our ball games were close, and we would put the pressure on the other teams, and we began to capitalize from their mistakes. I think the same things that other teams are doing to the old Mets. Well, I think 1969 probably will obviously remain the highlight of my baseball career. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The things that I remember most about it, winning the playoffs, Gary Gentry pitching, uh, Nolan Ryan strikeout performances in the uh, in the playoff games, the World Series, the people. It was just a, it was just incredible. I think the, the highlight really uh, was that last month when we were just we couldn't do anything wrong, and the Chicago Cubs could do nothing right. Uh, we just plowed through everybody that we came up against. 
And most surprising of all to the baseball world, the amazing Mets kept right on going. Past the Cubs, past the Braves in the playoffs, and then roared by the Orioles in five games to capture the World Series. The clincher came before a delirious crowd at Shea. And the play I was down on one knee, I remember, and he dashed for the bullpen in right field, trying to because the fans were just pouring out and coming onto the field. And, and I think the one thing that I remember most about that moment, that we had won the World Series, that we were world champions of 1969 in baseball, that nobody was better than we were. Speaking about 1973, there were things happening, uh, things like Dave Augustine's ball hitting off the top of the wall, uh, Cleon getting the ball, relaying it in, and throwing Richie Zisk out at home. Incredible things like that, saving, uh, saving ball games. And that's, I think that's when we took, overtook the Pirates and went into first place. In reference to the playoff games against Cincinnati, I think it was a very hard-fought uh, series. Uh, and I don't mean that to be uh, facetious or be, use it as a pun. It was, a, it was a two hard-nosed teams, and we played very hard. We totally uh, outscored them. Uh, they scored no more than two runs a game. They scored two runs the first game, won that one two to one. It was a game that I pitched, and then John Matlock shut them out the next day, whatever, six to nothing or whatever it was. Then they scored two runs in the rest of the games, and there was really no contest. The final out produced another wild celebration as the Mets captured their second National League pennant in five years. The fans were in love with their Mets, an expansion team that had won their hearts and now their praise. Always quick to adopt new Met heroes, the crowd found another popular start of their liking when Dave Kingman joined the club in 1975. Kingman was very glad to be aboard. Yeah, I viewed the Mets in previous years as, as a team of experience, uh, of older players, but I think from uh, 75 to 76, we've got a, a much younger club, a much faster club, and uh, a much more powerful club. Uh, I faced the Met pitching many, many times, and. Uh, it's a great thrill to be a part of the Mets and playing behind them. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to make a living anymore hitting against them. Kingman was off to a fantastic start in 76 with 32 home runs and 91 games when disaster struck. Uh, I can remember very distinctly Phil Necro was hitting Atlanta right here in Shea Stadium. And uh, ball, I was, I was playing him over in um, left center. And he was, of course, supposed to hit the ball to right field, but he blooped it right down the line. And, and uh, I caught up with the ball, and I dove, and, and, uh, and I heard something snap, and uh, tried to stay in the game a few extra pitches, or finished out the inning, but I knew something seriously had happened, and that was a very discouraging day as far as last year is concerned. Personally, I, I feel that uh, I had a successful year. Uh, it's very discouraging getting hurt, of course, and missing 33 games, but uh, I'm trying to overlook that, and. You put what is behind behind you and uh, always look to the future. Breaking the Met all-time home run record twice was, was great. Uh, I'd be foolish to say or be lying to you that it is not an honor to, uh, to hold a record like that. But uh, personally, I'm just going to go out and try to improve on my performance and, and, uh, and do what I can to uh, help the New York Mets win. When I go down the Met roster, I see nothing but young names and young ages. and. Uh, I'm happy I'm a part of that. Uh, the Mets have nothing but a fantastic future ahead of them. The Mets' future belongs to the strong young arms of pitchers like Bob Myrick, Nino Espinosa, Rick Baldwin, Bob Apodaca, Craig Swan, plus Jackson Todd from Tidewater. Behind the plate, John Stearns has unlimited potential. Roy Stager is a bright spot at third base. Mike Phillips is ready whenever and wherever he's needed. And the young outfielders can really swing those bats. Switch it in Lee Mazzilli. Mike Vale. And Bruce Beauclair. These exciting youngsters, joining with the young veterans Dave Kingman, John Milner, and John Matlack, have the New York Mets looking to the future with optimism and the promise of more of the fun years at Shea. Glancing back, it's been an incredibly fast 15 years. Looking to the future, Shea crowds will be enjoying new Mets heroes and additional Mets successes.
The tradition of celebrating our national pastime with good times includes special event days like Helmet Day, Jacket Day, Fan Appreciation Day, Family Day, Banner Day, Old-timers day that always includes the biggest stars and some magic moments from the past like this blast by Willie Mays. And of course, special occasions like the memorable night the Shea crowd roared a heartfelt welcome home to America's prisoner of war heroes. Or last year's bicentennial pageant. Yes, the amazing myths have already provided 15 years of fun. And there is much more to come in the years ahead.